in the world I know of who has been doing the work on uh, what we call mental liberation of African people any more than our uh, speaker tonight, uh, who has done uh, incredible work uh, and has done uh, perhaps the most beautiful uh, kind of work uh, regarding um, the African people that we know of. In fact, uh, early on, her work was done uh, fundamentally dealing with the questions of uh, slavery uh, and medicine during slavery. Uh, you know, a subject that most people never even thought about. You know, who treated the Africans when they got sick? And what diseases did they find in the Africans? And uh, she did that work, and it was pioneering work, and after she did her work, there were other people who followed her. That's always been her tradition. She goes out front, and then other people follow. Dr. Catherine Bancoli Medina is professor of history and chair of the Department of History, Geography, and Global Studies at Coppin State University in Baltimore. And hopefully, uh, we will get some news that she may even be even higher than that later. She is the author of many scholarly publications and has received national recognition uh, for her service in higher education and international recognition for her work in the social transformation of African people. Dr. Bancoli Medina is the author of the groundbreaking text, Slavery and Medicine, um, Enslavement and Medical Practices in Antebellum, Louisiana. Uh, and uh, she's also the author of the book, You Left Your Mind in Africa. You're, I don't know whether you ever heard Malcolm X uh, say, that was one of his favorite quotes when he talked about African-American people, because sometimes African-American people said, well, you know, I didn't leave anything in Africa. And Malcolm used to say, but you left your mind in Africa. So she, her title of her book is You Left Your Mind in Africa. Her most recent publications include The Historical Legacy of the Nadir and Houstonian Jurisprudence in the Origins of the Modern Civil Rights Movement. And this is about Charles uh, Hamilton Houston, of course, uh, the great uh, uh, legal mind who is responsible for most of the civil rights legislation that we have in this country. Most people don't know of it, never, probably never heard of him, but he was, of course, the mentor to Thurgood Marshall. And uh, Charles uh, uh, Houston was a professor of law, dean of law at Howard University, and constructed most of the legal arguments to bring down segregation in the United States of America. Um, her um, uh, title here uh, in the book J uh, that was edited by James Conyers, her title is Commanding Pestle and Mortal, Research Notes on the Odyssey of Black Women's Studies, History and Pedagogy in, spi in, in spite of the double, uh, in spite of the double drawbacks, African American Women in History and Culture, edited by Lopez uh, Matthews Jr. and others, the Association of Black Women Historians 2012, and in the age of Malcolm X, social conflict and the critique of African-American identity construction, which appears in Malcolm X, uh, a historical reader edited by James Conyers Jr. and James Smallwood. Dr. Bancoli Medina's research and scholarship is rooted in history and the African world experience, particularly reflecting her ex expertise in the history uh, of science, medicine, and terminology. In addition to her recent article on slavery and med medicine studies, which appears in Synergy Public History at Howard University, edited by Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis, she contributed the chapter Mul uh, um, Mulheres Africanas, Nos uh, est Estados Unidos. I, I wish my wife could uh, say this because she, she speaks Spanish much better than I do. Okay. Um, the, um, and then also she uh, has a chapter in a book, uh, uh, Afrocentricidade, uh, Afrocentricidade, 
which is actually published in Brazil. Um, this is edited by uh, Elisa Larkin Nascimento in Rio. Currently, her article, A Historical Account of Diagnostic Racism and the Southern Typhoid Fever Thesis, 1844 to uh, 1855, is pending peer review. Dr. Bancoli Medina is the founding editor of the scholarly journal, Africological Perspectives, and the blog and YouTube video series, History, La History is a State of Mind the recipient of many teaching, research, and service awards. Dr. Bancoli Medina received the first Distinguished Faculty Research Award from Coppin State University for her grant proposal encompassing the life and work of Fanny Jackson Coppin, the Fanny J. Coppin Digital History Institute, History Institute, and was recently named a fellow of the Malefic Kenti Asante Institute in Philadelphia. We are so proud of our fellow. She is a major, major scholar and a major person. And so at this time, I will turn uh, the podium over to uh, Dr. Catherine Bancoli Medina. We have to possess the strength to resurrect and transform ourselves. We need the power of transformation to resurrect. And you know resurrection is rebirth, regeneration, and this is an immense power. It's a renewal of the spirit, and this is a sacred spirit. In resurrection, we rise up. We are restored. And I assert, in resurrection, we do not ask for power. We are power. And that's, that's my premise. So in terms of resurrection, let us begin the discussion of the resurrection of the black mind with terms and concepts, okay? For human beings, the term resurrection, as we have come to understand it, refers to bringing a person back to life. I'm just gonna deal with humans now, okay? Um, we've got a situation where resurrection exists in world historical mythologies and renderings of religious uh, tenets uh, there is not one person, of course, probably in this room, who does not know that in the Christian religion, Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, right? But also, we know long, long before the Christian idea, we know that in ancient Kemet, Egypt, Asar, Osiris died and he rose from being dead. In fact, resurrection implies immortality. And so I thought long and hard about this. In some sense, all you need to do is come back once. And conceptually, you live forever in the sense that you have demonstrated the power to live again. And having done it, you can do it again. And in a deeper spiritual sense of immortality, meaning that once you resurrect, you can never die to be reborn again. So I think that's an important idea of resurrection. And while I make no claims to ecclesiastical scholarship, it seems to me that, it, that we find more examples of the concept of resurrection in Africa. And, and not just because I've spent you know, most of my time studying in this area, but, but I see it uh, more in examples of ancient Kemet than anywhere else. So specifically, I started to think about the story of Asar and Aset Isis uh, and also, you know, you have the, um, the sun god Ra dying each evening and being reborn, uh, with resurrected uh, each morning as we all were resurrected this morning, correct? Is there anybody who wasn't resurrected this morning? Because I, I really need to know. <laughs> we are familiar, we are familiar with Kefir, uh, the scarab. Uh, one of my, I, I'm so drawn to this uh, scarab symbol signified by the ability to transform um, or to manifest. In this concept, a journey is made. The beetle rolls the dung into a nurturing ball. It will use this ball to lay its eggs, which will eventually become larvae. The Egyptians understood the link uh, between this activity and the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars in everyday life. Um, it's the transformative actions that we see every single day. So for new African world people, resurrection is, uh, as so many of my able colleagues and elders have demonstrated, a function of Sankofa. 
using the Akan word. It is the power, the absolute ability to return and restore, to go back to one's source and to come forth with, which, with that which was lost and or stolen. And I digress ever so slightly, but I digress quite a bit. So let me just say uh, about this that I remember three decades ago uh, the Afrocentric explication of the concept of Sankofa is just one of the many cultural artifacts retrieved from the motherland and in this specific case uh, uh, our West African family that was dropped into world consciousness. And in my mind it heralded the resurrection of the black mind. So I know we're talking about this now. Dr. Sante has been talking about this for 40, 50 years uh, at least. Um, but I, you know, I see it as something that I became uh, much more familiar with about 30 years ago. Okay, and uh, 30 years, huh? Wow, never thought about it until now. Okay, so we have Sankofa as one of our many cultural artifacts, and I wasn't going to talk about all of the artifacts, but you know, I, we could do that at some point. Uh, Kente um, is an artifact. Um, we can just go on and on and on. And when I say these, these, these items were dropped into the world culture in such a way as to identify them with African world people. Okay? So we look at this, we look at this act and art of resurrection uh, not as a passive enterprise or a nebulous metaphysical twi twist of fate. African people have demonstrated that resurrection is a function of Sankofa. In order for us to resurrect our minds, we must go back to our source, our Africanity, our history, heritage, ancestry, culture, values, beliefs, our ethos, and bring it forward into the present. By bringing it forward, we birth it. In principle, we essentially rebirth ourselves out of necessity and always out of love for ourselves. We must understand that our Sankofa resurrection is an African odyssey that requires immense struggle. Our Sankofa resurrection is a protracted journey fraught with unknown territory. We call it the uh, terra incognita. Uh, Leviathans, wholly bent on our destruction, and alongside them, counterfeit soothsayers who attempt to distort the reality of our blackness and to appropriate our future. Resurrection. Blackness. Wow. I have a feeling that there won't be a lot of silence when I start talking about blackness. Let us turn our attention to the term black. The term black is wholly contextual. We know what we mean here in this space at the Institute when we say black. We are referring to black people, but who or what are black people? There is a reference to black as skin color, but even the color of people's skin is not black as we have come to perceive the term, I am black. There should be no doubt in anybody's mind, at least not here at the Institute. And we have a lot of people across generations and across cultures weighing in on the concept of black. And so I have to go back to those cultural nuances that uh, impacted me. And so I remember as a child hearing entertainer James Brown uh, once sing, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And we walked around the neighborhood and we sang that all day and all night long until we were told to shut up because it was getting on people's nerves. I mean, you know, not the sentiment, but you know, the, rep the, the constant repetition. Um, we are given after her death the important idea to be young, gifted, and black. The name of the play derived of the works of playwright Lorraine Hansberry. We could devote an entire symposium to explicating the term black, or as Sekou Sundiata has rapped, I could run out of breath before I digest the rest of what I don't know. Now, I didn't say I could rap, but, um, but I do think he makes an important point here as we talk about the term Negro or Negro and all of the negative connotations, ancient and modern, that we have seen associated with this term, but also the positive references of the term that we rarely talk about. But for the sake of time, I am presenting the term black here to mean specifically and definitively people of African descent. Okay, does that, does that help? Yes. Si, 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 senora, si. Okay. <laughs> as Peter Tosh sang, no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. People remember that? Yes. Okay, because you all know, you all in the MK, 
a institute. You have to talk to me. I'm really old school. Okay. Now he says, no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. And then he goes on to talk about, it doesn't matter if you're plexion high, 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 or your plexion low, 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 or if you're plexion in between, your complexion. You're an African. So we know this from those cultural nuances. So as a moment ago, I stated that I am black, and I am, but I'm also African. When I say people of African descent, I'm talking about black people. There are Africans born on the continent of Africa, born in South America and North America and the United States, all over the world. I know that we want to stop here. We want to raise issues of blackness and Africanity that we are confronted with every day, and we will. But for our purposes here, I am talking about African people, and I'm making the same reference as, as the same people as Dr. Mazama does with AI and Dr. Asante does in his vast <laughs> body of literature. So if we accept blackness as Africanity, and at least on the surface, attribute this identity to ancestry, geography, culture, history, and phenotype, there are so many areas that we can discuss here. We will, we, let's just presume a benign implication. But if Africanity is ancestry, geography, culture, history, and phenotype, is there anything else central to resurrecting the black mind? Well, I say that there is. I say that the answer is yes. If Africanity is ancestry, geography, culture, history, phenotype, and it is, then there is another fundamental component, and that component is consciousness. In the discussion entitled, What is Blackness? in Asante's An African Manifesto, which is one of my favorite books. I made my students review it. Uh, they had an awesome time. And so with the African Manifesto, he introduces blackness as consciousness, a perspective, a form of thought, and awareness. So, and many of you remember from the 1960s, we were trying to gain consciousness. And we could recognize those who were not conscious. And we wanted to, we wanted a black consciousness to permeate our lives. Therefore, while I maintain that all those who are black are African, not all Africans are black in terms of their consciousness. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I was up late, you know, but okay. Therefore, blackness is Africanity, a reference to persons of African descent who share among many things, ancestry, geographical antiquity, culture, history, phenotype, and consciousness. Of these characteristics, at least one, consciousness is so important that without it, within the context of all the other characteristics, we will not be able to resurrect ourselves as a people. In the remarkable text, Afrocentricity, the Theory of Social Change, Asante situates blackness as a function of Afrocentricity with high human ethical thought and action. That is, to be black is to be against all forms of oppression, racism, classism, homophobia, patriarchy, child abuse, pedophilia, and white racial domination. Once again, blackness is Africanity, an indication of African descendant peoples who are connected through ancestry, geography, antiquity, culture, history, phenotype, consciousness, and ethical behavior. Blackness, Africanity, a substantial, it is a, and it is an, substantial identity. It is a substantial and elegant identity. So as we consider the import of this, then where does our consciousness come from? That's a good question. I think it's time for a quiz. Where does our consciousness come from? Anybody feel like talking about that? I do. The mind, okay? <clears throat> What about the mind? What is the mind? What are we referring to here? I dare say in this day and age, we need to talk about what a mind is. In this day and age, we toy with the creation of artificial intelligence. They're still talking about that, doing lots of work in artificial intelligence. The idea that humans can create machines with minds capable of executing independent thought and making decisions, okay? Now, we can come back to that, but as far as humans are concerned, we can see that we can't see the mind. We can't see the mind. Can we? We can't really see the mind, but most of us believe that we have one. Correct? Fair enough. Okay. Now, if you're going to, bear with me a little bit. 
I have come to understand that the mind encompasses our ability to think, the processes of reasoning, the ability to understand. The mind is consciousness. Not just our awareness, but our understanding, our perception, our ability to critically consider the world. We organize our thoughts with our mind. The mind is such a vast concept that it is often discussed as an extension of our physical being. We could speak in terms of the mind of the Afrocentricist. We could detail the world mind. We often attempt to know the mind of God. And if truth be told, it is our mind, what we think and hold to be true above all else in this world, that is the arbiter of human existence. It's what we fight about every single day, what we think, what we believe. Now, our mind houses our memory. The mind helps us to remember the past. When we remember the past, we resurrect that which was previously dormant to us just even a moment ago. Now, if you like, I could resurrect what it was like from my perspective to be a graduate student in the first doctoral program in African-American studies in the world. My mind would tell me to tell you that when I was there, it was the golden age. But I digress. <laughs> as I often do. The mind facilitates our ability to image what we want to see in the world. If we can see it inside of our mind's eye, we can realize it. I remember listening to Anna talk about the, the, um, the bringing into being of the Institute last March. And she stood where I'm standing now. And, and she talked about all of the, 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 the preparation and the planning that went into uh, this building and the renovations, and it was really awesome. But, you know, but I'm thinking, you know, she, she could see it. The Asantes could see it, and, and it exists. We can realize it. We can bring from nothingness, which is nothingness is a kind of to... Uh, to somethingness, okay? Uh, once again, we could talk incessantly about the mind, what it is and what it can do. We can also um, expound upon such terms uh, as ideas, decisions, philosophy, language. Uh, uh, hold on just a moment. Maybe the, could you turn that sound on? I turned it on by accident. I turned the sound on the computer by accident. I'm sure none of you all can hear it. Um, you just thought it was part of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, initially it was. It was a part of the presentation. One of the things that happened, <laughs> one of the things that happened, oh, you just closed out of the box. One of the things that happened was that um, it, it, I didn't know that uh, YouTube jumps around now. They can, they can loop your videos and, and just do all kinds of things without you even knowing about it. Gracias, mi vida. So, so now we have our mind and memory and bringing, uh, um, bringing something out of nothingness. And once again, we could talk incessantly about the mind, what it can do. And I, you know, we, we think about these terms, ideas, decisions, philosophy, language, visualization, intention, uh, culture, emotion, and it's exhaustive. The mind can reveal anything to us. Um, and, and the mind is sacred. It's, it's not just a potent force, it's a sacred force. Now, when I say sacred, I mean that let us hold on to the thought that the mind, among so many other things, not only informs and directs us, the mind is spirit, the mind is soul, the mind is abstract and concrete. Either way, it's transcendent. Not only making it sacred, it is the source of our understanding and realization of our existence as a people. In another life, I once wrote a poem entitled, Where the Mind Goes, the Body Follows. And it's a simple yet powerful idea. Would I be telling the truth if I said, my mind brought me here today? Would you be telling the truth if you said your mind brought you here today, correct? We have to consider these because I know there are lots of activities today and I wanted to be, I wanted to come to all of them. 
Um, unfortunately, I couldn't, but, um, but I know that my mind got me here today. The concept of the mind is so profound, so great, that we would do well to preserve it in, in this existence. And I really mean this. The concept of the mind is so profound, I'll say it again, so great, that we would do well to preserve it in this existence as one would not want to live in eternity without one's mind. Would you? No, senora. Okay. Finally, our concern here is the Afrocentric mind with its specific conceptual processes or using Dr. Mazama's eloquent statement in the Afrocentric paradigm where she outlined the basis of the cognitive aspects of Afrocentricity, uh, talking about that we are, we are dealing with the, organi the organizing principle that determines the perception of all reality, the centrality of the African experience for African people. Thus, what defines Afrocentricity is the crucial role attributed to the African social and cultural experience as our ultimate reference. This is what distinguishes it from any previous body of thought. Therefore, the resurrection of the black mind is, as Dr. Karinga might put it, unthinkable and therefore inconceivable without the development and full unfettered expression of the Afrocentric mind. Now, with all that said, I want to try to improve upon our initial statement. So let me begin by saying that the resurrection of the black mind is composed of our ability to use our strength to transform our lives. In this process, we need the power of transformation to impact our collective consciousness. For African people, this rebirth and regeneration is necessary to address the plethora of challenges facing our people the world over. This is an immense power, one that will renew the sacred spirit while at the same time effectively address our concerns. In this resurrection, we rise up to address the historical and contemporary expressions of racism. As we are restoring, we are restored. It is a high learning curve. The energy required to fight injustice simultaneously reinvigorates. Thus, in the resurrection of the black mind, once again, we do not ask for power, we are power.